I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. Or Chicky. Join us as we explore the largest and northernmost state in the U.S., Alaska. In the first episode of this series, we cruise on the MS Nordam with Holland America through the famous Inside Passage from Canada to Alaska. We learn about the local indigenous timber and fishing culture, visiting charming towns in picturesque sounds. Get up close to the local wildlife performing powerful displays in their natural arena. And get a true taste of the wild northwestern frontier as we time travel to the historic gold rush of the late 1800s. the true highlight of any trip through the Inside Passage, glaciers, glaciers, and more glaciers, as we cruise through dynamic fjords where mountains tower above and rivers of ice meet the ocean. We experience the best cruising Alaska has to offer, bringing you with us on each and every adventure along the way. Join us for these amazing experiences and more on Global Travel Stories. This episode continues on from our previous series after the completion of our three-week adventure camp eventing throughout Western Canada. All right, Chicky, going on. Yeah. <laughs> after several hours lining up, we are finally boarding our cruise, which is the Nordam with Holland America. Had a great day today actually, caught up with a, an old friend Amber and also got to say goodbye to Shay. Had lunch at our uh, hostel at the Canby and now we're about to aboard, aboard our Alaskan cruise for seven nights. So we had originally booked ourselves an inside stateroom because we got a good price and we're on a pretty tight budget. We booked this whole trip, the Canada-Alaska cruise back in 2019 for 2020 and we all know what happened in 2020. When we arrived at our inside stateroom, it was roomy, but we kind of wanted a little bit more. So we decided to splurge a little and upgrade ourselves to the balcony. Oh, that balcony, look at that view already. We haven't even left Vancouver yet. It's already amazing. Look at this, all this space. That's Vancouver Island over there, Miranda. We were immediately taken by the luxurious standard being hosted by Holland America. As adventure travelers, we almost fell out of place in a good way. Spent our second day at sea enjoying the entertainment provided by Holland America and the facilities of the MS Nordam. Not a bad day to spend at sea. Shana and the chicky enjoying a hot, warm spa. <laughs> Out on the top deck here, on the Nordam. What's the plan today, Miranda? Nothing. Nothing. This is the plan. Nothing. This is the plan. We did come out to spot whales. We saw a few spouts in the distance. We saw probably more last night. Yeah, we saw a lot last night. 
So we'll probably see a lot later on today, I assume. Yeah, it's just chilling up on the upper deck. It's not bad. Beautiful morning here in Ketchikan, Alaska. Just arrived in Alaska. It is pretty early, it's 7 a.m. My clothes are currently drying. Almost ready to go out and see the world. It's amazing out here. Honestly, it's 15 degrees Celsius, that is, and it's reaching up to about 25 degrees today, so a lot warmer than I imagined Alaska was going to be. We've got a lot of stuff planned today. We're gonna to show you when we get there. Alaska! This is where Miranda's spending the whole day. settlement of the gold rush period all of these houses here on Creek Street or well, most of them at least were actually brothels but now they're more of a it's more of a tourist thing so we are in Saxman village just outside of Ketchikan and it is home to the largest collection of totem poles in the world. So they have 29 different totems here, most of which have been relocated in the 1930s from original Tlingit and Haida villages. Some of them are replicas because a lot of the original ones deteriorated and some of them have been touched up and rejuvenated in certain ways, but a lot of them are original totems. Klingits from the old villages of Tongas and Cape Fox wanted a new site to construct a school and Presbyterian church. The village subsequently was named after Samuel Saxman, a Presbyterian teacher who was lost at sea with a Cape Fox elder while searching for the new site. In the 1930s, many totem poles and ceremonial artifacts such as carvings and masks were retrieved from the abandoned villages at Cape Fox, Tongas, Cat Island and Pennock Island. Totem poles were restored and relocated to Saxman as part of a US Forest Service program. Saxman Village has 25 of the 80 totem poles scattered around Ketchikan, making it the totem capital of the world. idea it's but hard to tell. anyways it's fine we're just gonna sort of chill out we're gonna go to the great alaskan lumberjack show which i heard is pretty cool and a must do in ketchikan so at least yeah. we'll get to do that and yeah, we'll just have a day to roam around exactly miranda was really looking forward to doing the crab i was as well. i love crabs these were actually dungeness crabs and uh, alaska is known for the king crabs the big king crab legs so we're gonna try and do king crab at some stage during this trip maybe not while we're on the cruise because we do have quite some time here in alaska so yeah. we'll see cool. Cool. Okay. The 
Great Alaskan Lumberjack Show is a competition performance style show pitting a long held rivalry between Alaskan and Canadian lumberjack camps. The contestants go through a myriad of loosely related lumberjack themed trials, complete with comedic antics and audience participation. huge insight into Alaskan timber culture, but the show ends up being a whole lot of entertaining and worthwhile fun. So Miranda, what do you think of the Great Alaskan Lumberjack show? It was very entertaining. It was pretty funny. It reminded me of like WWE, you know, they came out and they had these mock fights and they were pushing each other around and had all this really interesting banter. Um, I don't even know, I don't think those guys were really lumberjacks, but um, they were obviously skilled at what they were doing and it was it was very entertaining. It was a cool little skit. Yeah, definitely worth doing. Yeah, definitely worth it. It was cool. So we have to wear masks at the moment on the indoor areas of the ship. I'll quickly show you through one of the restaurants. We've got three free restaurants that are included. One's called the Lido Market, which we are currently in right now. And it's kind of like an all-you-can-eat marketplace. So there's tons of different styles of food from all over the world. Uh, the other one's called the Dining Room, which is more of an a la carte style. And then they've got like a burger bar. So it's burgers, hot dogs, fries, all that sort of stuff. This is pretty cool. You've got the, the dessert. Look at all the food. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome. There's a few different stations here. You get a different station on the other side as well. Before departing Ketchikan, Alaska's first city, we decided to take one last look around town. Okay, now we're on a race to head back to the ship because we're about to leave. It is freaking hot, I can tell you that. I wasn't expecting that for Alaska. Of course, along the way, I've grabbed myself a growler from Bowden Street Brewing Company, and that's the cream ale. So I'm gonna enjoy that on the balcony as we are departing. we were farewelled by local seals looking for an evening snack under the golden light of a spectacular sunset. Do you know where we are? Juno! Juno! That's right. And do you know that Juno is the capital of Alaska? So, do you know, even though it's not the largest city, Anchorage is by far the largest city by population here in Alaska, Juno is in fact the capital. And it can only be reached by either boat, 
or plane. So you can't actually reach Juneau by road, which is cool. Well, Juneau, I actually didn't know that Juneau was the capital of Alaska. I always what? thought it was Anchorage. Yeah. No. <laughs> I had no idea so, until this trip. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we doing today, Miranda? Um, we're going whale watching. So we're going on a whale quest and visiting the Mendenhall Glacier. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's do it. Let's do it. With our eagle eyes set on whale watching, we came across our first humpbacks, which can be identified by the unique pattern on their tails. The first of which was a familiar and well-observed whale known as flame. Most mature female humpback whales have calves only once every two to four years, although occasionally humpback whales will calve two years in a row. But flame surpassed that by bringing back calves to Alaska three years consecutively. September, whales can be seen in Alaskan waters from the Gulf of Alaska in the south to the eastern Bering Sea and the northern Beaufort Sea. Many humpbacks migrate to Alaska after spending the winter months in the warmer waters of Hawaii, Baja California, Mexico, and Central America. As water temperatures rise, whales return to cooler feeding grounds rich in krill and other plankton. Alaska's pristine icy waters are an ideal place for this. Glacier in Juneau, Alaska. That's exactly right. It's the Mandenhall Glacier right there. And that is the Nugget Falls. just saw some of the sockeye salmon that are swimming upstream to the place where they spawn. It essentially is the place where they were born and because of a chemical in the water they can actually detect where they originally came from and make their way to their place of birth which is really interesting. Now all the salmon in this area that's just coming up here right now is attracting something else and that's what we're on the lookout for which are bears. We've got black bears and brown bears which are the grizzly bears. That's what we really want to see. Not too closely. Alrighty, so no bears, unfortunately. Say we weren't having very good luck, okay? okay. 
we will probably see them at some stage. We are walking through the main street of Juno right now. We head down to the famous Red Dog Saloon, which is an old sort of wild western saloon from the gold mining period. famous Red Dog Saloon, and the ground is literally made of sawdust. <laughs> Founded during Juno's mining era, the saloon maintains the frontier feel of the period, with memorabilia such as a gun claimed to be checked in and never retrieved by Wyatt Earp. The saloon is now a major tourist attraction with live music that tends to involve the whole establishment, including the waitstaff. This is a big one. If you get caught talking or texting on the cell phone, you buy the house around the drinks. Okay, so here's my hot tip for those of you doing a cruise ship. Generally, if you're getting a beer from the minibar and you want to chill out on your beautiful veranda, have a beer, it's going to cost you about $7. Now, those of you from countries like Australia or New Zealand, you probably think, that's not a bad price. Well, let me tell you, if you're here in Juneau, and probably some of the other towns as well. You go to into a, a regular liquor store, you can probably get yourself a beer or a six pack of beers for less than that. Okay, so I paid six seventy five for that, and that is a mixture of different local beers, craft beers even, from the area for the price of one beer here. And you can take six on board as well, so you can actually bring them up onto the, the ship without having to sneak them in and six times it's fun right so we are in downtown Skagway and it kind of feels like you're being transported back to the late 1800s during the gold rush era it has that real sort of historic feel to it. We are going to go for a couple of little walks today, and then what are we doing, Miranda? Going on the White Pass Railway to the Yukon, so that'll be pretty cool. Yeah, it'll be pretty cool. So it is a historic rail journey, and we are going to check that out and learn a little bit more about the gold mining history in the area. Just a beautiful Skagway day today. Supposedly it rains here all the time, like 300 days of the year, so what do you expect? At least it's light. Miranda has corrected me, that was Juno that rains most of the time. What do they say Skagway is? The sunshine city of Alaska. Look at it's that. It's the most sunshine, <laughs> but we just so happen to be here on the day that it's raining. Look at that sunshine. Which is fine. Hey? It's not bad. Beautiful, beautiful <laughs> sunny day in the sunshine capital of Alaska. So we were just down at Yucatania Point and now we're at Smuggler's Cove. We're gonna take the AB trail up and back around, do a little bit of a loop. And then we should be back at the ship in time for lunch. So 
unlike the name suggests, Smuggler's Cove was actually never used for smuggling. In fact, it was a Tlinga settlement in this area here for quite some time, so there's the local First Nations people. They actually shared it for a brief time with Euro-Americans just after the gold rush, and I believe that was up until about 1924. So, interesting place. No smugglers though. restaurant option that we have here, it's actually in the pool area on deck 9 of the Nordam, is dive in. So it's your burger bar, we've got the hot dogs, we've also got a bratwurst and a hamburger. These are all actually Beyond Meat, so they had the vegetarian options as well. And if you haven't tried Beyond Meat, I think it's actually Beyond Burgers. They're amazing, but dig in. So we're about to board the White Pass Railway, which is a very scenic railway. It goes up to White Pass on the border of the Yukon in Canada, and it's actually gonna take us over the Canadian border, but we won't be leaving the train, so we don't actually need our passports. It's completed on the 1st of August, 1900, and it was supposed to service the Klondike gold fields up in the Yukon, up in a place called Dawson City. Now, by the time it was actually completed, the miners that would normally take several months journey to get up there, would now be able to get up there nice and quickly, but the biggest problem was that all the gold was gone basically by the time the railway was complete, so it's a little bit ironic in that. It was a, quite an arduous journey though. It almost took a year from the west coast of the US, places like Seattle, to board a, a boat that would take them up here to Skagway, and then they would hike for several months through the mountains to get up to the coal fields. Crazy, crazy, crazy journey. experience in the White Pass Railway is probably not the ideal representation of the voyage itself. Unfortunately, due to bad weather, the supposed magnificent views below weren't as spectacular as expected. Also, we had long delays due to rockfall on the track, which stranded the previous train several hours in the mountains. plan was to cycle the Klondike Highway from the top of the Canadian side of the border. However, this was also cancelled. And as a matter of opinion, the narration was told with zero enthusiasm and read straight from a script. We don't normally complain about experiences, but honestly, this was probably the least enjoyable experience on the trip, yet one of the most expensive. We met other people who have enjoyed this experience, so maybe we just went on an unlucky expedition, but it's probably not something we'd personally recommend under these conditions. Okay, so today is the day. Today is when we get to see Glacier Bay. Glacier Bay National Park is known as the highlight of the trip, which is a huge, huge deal. One of the reasons why we chose Holland America is because not only is it the first company to operate in Alaska, but also as well, they have grandfather rights going into Glacier Bay, which means that we're going in before any other ship, which is really, really cool. So we're going to get to see the glaciers first. So we're up nice and early. We're going to go up on to the top deck, and they're actually opening up the bow of the boat. So I'm going to check that out. You excited, Chicky? So excited. <laughs> Let's go see some glaciers. Another really 
really cool thing about this ship is that we actually get some national park rangers to come on board and uh, they're giving a whole bunch of information at the moment, telling us what we can see. They've even got a little setup downstairs, which I'll show shortly. But they said that weather actually today is really, really good and the clarity and visibility is already much better than yesterday, so it's only gonna lift from there. Starting to see some glaciers in the distance. Now, because it's so calm in here today, we're actually going around this island over here known as Composite Island. So that's something they don't normally do, which is really, really cool. We've already seen mountain goats and sea otter, so keep an eye out for bears now. high rocky mountains, we could spot in the distance mountain goats with the full confidence to daringly graze high upon slippery ridges. While below, sea otters playfully swimming in the frigid glacial waters. Distance, we spot our first of the Tidewater Glaciers. We're in the bow of the ship here at uh, Glacier Bay. We've got the Grand Pacific Glacier over there, and this one over here that's carving off, that's the Marjorie Glacier. So this is the advantage of having our own balcony. <laughs> Glaciers. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I'm gonna grab a beer. Tucked away within valleys, we spotted hanging glaciers. Many of these glaciers have retreated rapidly in the last century. These would have until recently met with the bay below as tidewater glaciers, which by definition reached the sea. Close to the glaciers, we could spot sea otters lounging around and snuggling on icebergs. The reason why they do this is to conserve energy and share body heat as they lack the sufficient amount of body fat to keep them warm in these ice cold conditions. This is also why they have the most dense fur in the animal kingdom. Their fur was widely sought after and almost led to their complete extinction between the 17 and 1900s when otter numbers dropped from 300,000 to almost 1,000 individuals. Luckily, due to conservation, their numbers have rebounded to about 150,000.
So this area known as Glacier Bay is actually a 65 mile long bay or inlet. Back in 1750, there was actually a glacier that sat right here where the bay currently now is. The glacier itself was 100 miles long, so it extended right out to the mouth of the bay itself. Prior to that, there was actually a Tlingit village, which is now currently under the water. So the glacier itself has retreated quite a distance back, 65 miles back. There's a lot of scientists coming out here and studying just because of the change of these glaciers, how quickly they are retreating. It's worth visiting while it's still here and still in all its glory because it may change even within our lifetimes. So behind me here you can see the Lamplu Glacier and you can see the blue colour in the glacier as well. So the reason why the colour is so blue is because of the refraction of light. The way glaciers are formed are basically piles of snow that compact year after year after year. And as the snow gets higher, it gets heavier and it compresses the snow on the bottom under the weight. It's kind of like squeezing a snowball in your hand. It turns it into sort of this rock hard solid ice. Over time, that ice tends to melt from the bottom. So essentially what happens with the glaciers is they actually slide down the hills. And that's why they call them rivers of ice. So, Miranda's got here her order in, done in service there. She's ordered some chili, veg chili. And quesadillas. And quesadillas. And cookies. It's a, it's a Mexican fiesta out here on our balcony. Oh. And where are we, Miranda? College Fjord. College Fjord. Why don't you tell our viewers what the difference is between a fjord and a sound? Mm -hmm. Remember this Try one? to test me from knowledge way back. Mm -hmm. um, from doubtful sound. A fjord. Mm -hmm. Well, a sound connects to the ocean. Mm -hmm. No, fjord connects to the ocean. They both connect to the ocean. What's the difference between the two? A fjord is carved out by glaciers. Yeah. Glaciers, and a sound is not Yep. So that's, that's good enough. We'll give a point to that one. That's pretty good, yeah. So a fjord is actually created when a glacier carves down through a uh, valley and it widens up the valley into a U-shape 
and then it reaches the ocean and then over time typically since the last ice age when the sea levels rose it back floods the actual valley that has been created forming a fjord which is what we see here a sound is very similar except it's carved out by a river so that's the major difference and we do have glaciers here in college fjord that's why we're basically traveling to the end of the fjord right now we're almost at the end We've seen a few glaciers along the way and we're going to see a really spectacular glacier down the end here and it's kind of funny to think, you know, similar with what we saw yesterday at Glacier Bay, that the whole region was carved out by glaciers at one point. And you can imagine these big, giant glaciers. In the case of Glacier Bay, only 250-odd years ago, we had a 100-mile-long glacier carving out those valleys. So it's just uh, it's kind of crazy to think how rapidly these things change, but how much power they have behind them to, the, to forge and change the landscape. So I can already see the glacier coming up. It's pretty spectacular. say College Fjord is actually probably more impressive than Glacier Bay. We are getting very close to this place here. <laughs> and this thing is huge. What do you think, Chicky? It's pretty impressive. <laughs> wow. Impressive than Glacier Bay. Yeah, this one's the biggest one that we've seen so far. It's huge. It's just College Fjord consists of five large tidewater glaciers, five valley glaciers, and dozens of smaller hanging glaciers. The largest of the tidewater glaciers is Harvard Glacier, covering an area of 12,000 acres. It is 1.5 miles or 2 kilometers wide and an impressive 300 feet or 91 meters thick. Okay, how spectacular is that? Look at that behind us there. That's yeah, amazing, it's right? Huge. <laughs> so our advice is if you are heading northbound on this journey from uh, Vancouver up to Whittier, Alaska, choose the, the starboard side, the right hand side of the boat. You want to get all these views along the way and it's just so magical. It's amazing. We've had awesome views. Although the captain's very good as well as turning the boat around so that the port side gets the views as well especially when it comes to go, going to the end of these fjords and seeing the glaciers. But the starboard side has been excellent going. Starboard side has been getting the, the best views, honestly. The whole way it's been spectacular. Due to adverse weather conditions, at times College Fjord is not accessible by cruise ships. So we felt very fortunate that our conditions allowed us to view what we considered one of the highlights of our trip in Alaska.
right here is a perfect example of what uh, glaciers look like when they retreat. They leave this bare rock and then over time, you'll have grass growing over the soil, eventually trees and forests, and it leaves this unique looking landscape like we have in all these valleys around us. Join us on our next episode as we depart our Inside Passage cruise and venture inland to view more spectacular glaciers, wildlife, and land on North America's highest mountain as we explore the largest, northern, and most remote state in the USA. This Alaska series is just getting started. Follow us for these adventures to come and much more on Global Travel Stories. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel, become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family, or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.